Hey everybody, this is Mike Mathis. I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist at Michigan Medicine uh, with a research focus on using data science techniques to improve clinical care, uh, which is what I'll be speaking about uh, today. Uh, in this talk, in contrast to other talks I've seen given in this forum, I'll be focusing on some of the, the touchy-feely side of machine learning applied to healthcare, um, the perspectives of clinicians who may not be experts in machine learning or data science techniques, uh, and who may have some skepticism as to how useful these algorithms actually are. I think um, this group I know is very uh, well trained. We have some of the most, uh, the smartest, most knowledgeable faculty um, in this audience, and the and, um, and and certainly are at the cutting edge of developing these algorithms. And I think, um, but I think it's also interesting to hear kind of the implementation strategies uh, used and and how to meet, uh, you know, kind of converge on a common language with clinicians on the front line, again, who may not be experts um, in, in these algorithms. And so that's what I want to talk about today. And so we'll be talking about just the challenges to earning clinician trust and, and uh, having their, um, uh, winning their confidence that uh, machine learning algorithms are a credible way to improve care. I don't have any personal financial relationships with any vendor, but my research is supported by grants through the NIH and the Department of Defense. Um, in addition to presenting to you virtually today, I have to apologize, I'm also presenting to you in a different location in space time. I am recorded this lecture on Monday of this week uh, since I was required to be in the operating rooms Wednesday. And so I apologize uh, that I'm unable to engage in a discussion during this talk uh, but I definitely don't want to be inaccessible to those who were interested, maybe even disagreed with the content of this talk. I'd love to touch base with you. Uh, so feel free to email me at the, at the contact here uh, or, over con or over Twitter or however you'd like. Um, but I'm very uh, interested in staying engaged with this group. So in this talk, uh, there's a couple of different sections. Uh, the first part of it is just simply setting the stage for what a uh, what we need to do to have a conversation with clinicians who may have a varying level of familiarity with machine learning. And I will say varying uh, optimistically, um, many clinicians have basically no familiarity with machine learning algorithms and their strengths and their limitations, and many are very skeptical. So it is important to make the case to clinicians why they should care and what um, you know what you know what steps we need to take to be able to trust that these algorithms may be used safely and for the better of uh, patient care after establishing this problem space i'll then talk about some real examples or near future examples of machine learning or ai applied to my own field anesthesiology and for each example i don't want to go into f um, a ton of detail about the study although i suggest that those who are interested can read further about um, the study. Uh, and I instead want to use each of the um, examples as a way to illustrate a few critically important dilemmas in machine learning applied to healthcare that all clinicians should become acquainted with, that we have, um, that, uh, that uh, faculty within this group are familiar with, um, but um, may have, haven't considered exactly how to start conversations with clinicians and grapple some of these challenges um, in interpreting and applying machine learning algorithms appropriately and mitigating against different challenges. Um, so we'll start with, with the first part of the problem space. And the first thing that I've, uh, the issues that I've had in, in having conversations with my own clinical colleagues is that it's important to even talk, uh, clarify you know, what we're even talking about um, and just to converge on um, what specific type of AI is being, uh, is growing in, in healthcare applications. Um, and we know that there's four different levels of complexity in AI. And there's on the left, the simplest, the reactive AI, which has no, no memory. It's very narrowly defined, has very task uh, specific goals. Uh, and that's an example of that is uh, Deep Blue, that the, the chess program that beat Gary Kasparov in the 1990s. Um, the next stage is, is limited memory. That's, that's really what, we're, what we have today. This is um, a little bit broader, but, but still um, t um, 
task specific AI. Um, you know, it has an ability to learn from previous data, uh, adapt and, and um, make uh, you use that evolving data to make predictions um, that guide um, clinical decision making or diagnostics uh, or prognoses. And, the, and these are still very vulnerable to edge cases, to new healthcare context. And that's, you know, it's important consideration that and those are the conversations that we need to have um, with clinicians. And the, the other two, the other side of this table, the, the third and fourth are, you know, I've, I've, I've had clinicians kind of jump to these and it's important to emphasize that th these, aren't, these aren't what we have today. These, this is, these are not, rea this is not reality. The, the third stage being theory of mind, which is a s psychology term kind of getting at the notion that, um, you know, um, that there's there's um, human reasoning in in decision making. That there is there's both um, you know a objective intelligence and an emotional intelligence. And this um, you know one of the next major hurdles for machine learning algorithms to c overcome is is having a algorithm that mimics this thought process that can learn from fewer examples um, because it understands a human reasoning um, and, um, and intent behind decision making. And then, and then the last stage on the far right, the self level of self-awareness is the level of machine learning where um, there's a human level of intelligence that can actually bypass our own intelligence and b is physically indistinguishable from, from uh, uh, humans. And, and that's really important to uh, emphasize that we know we're not, we're not on that right side of this table. We're at the limited memory side. Um, this, is, this is our focus. This is where we're at in, in the world today. It's also important to frame, um, a, you know, frame the goals of uh, machine learning algorithms to clinicians and frontline users. Um, it's, it's important to reiterate that physicians will always have a place in medicine and that machine learning algorithms are great tools, um, but they're no suitable, they're no substitute for the judgment, the intuition, and the care of a thoughtful clinician who understands the full context, has all of the data, not just the data the algorithm has, and can understand the impact of their clinical decision making. Beyond um, kind of scoping out the, the, the goals, it's, it's uh, important to highlight the strengths and weaknesses to, of machine learning to clinicians. Um, we, we know this very well, uh, as um, faculty in this group know this very well, but just to reiterate, machine learning algorithms, they're very quick, they're very cheap, um, and uh, they can make accurate, I say quote unquote, unbiased uh, d predictions. Uh, put that in quotes simply because if the algorithm is trained on data and decision making from humans who are implicitly biased, then they will also replicate those biases, uh, but, um, but you can get some replicable prediction. Um, but the disadvantage of machine learning algorithms is that, of course, they lack transparency and they lack a full understanding of the clinical context, the judgment that clinicians have, uh, their experiences having taken care of thousands upon thousands of patients um, and understanding fully why the patient in front of them today is different than the past 1,000 patients that they've taken care of. Um, beyond the, uh, you know, the strengths and the weaknesses and the opportunities of machine learning, um, it's, it's helpful to motivate clinicians why they should care. And the way I do this is I will talk about how ma you know, machine learning and, and AI is, is disrupting every industry and healthcare isn't any different. Um, these changes are coming and the best thing that clinicians can do is prepare for them. And just like interpreting and trusting um, and applying um, journal articles that we're reading about in our clinical journals and, and having, uh, you know, be able, being able to understand them demands a literacy in statistics and, um, and study design. Just, you know, just like that is, is demanded when reading a journal article, um, a article on machine learning should also have a, uh, should demand for among clinicians a, a basic literacy in, in the methods uh, that they're uh, derived from. And, um, and, and, and one other th thing I would, I would mention is that um, unlike, you know, other industries, AI machine learning has been extremely slow to be implemented in healthcare and with good reason. And so that's helpful for tempering the hype, but also earning 
trust from uh, skeptics that um, you know s skeptics in the in the um, uh, about the strengths um, of of machine learning and how um, they may be used or misused in healthcare. And things to think about are that mistakes matter in healthcare. So you know, whereas Facebook misclassifies if it misclassifies your face as your twin brothers, that's annoying, but it's not dangerous. Um, and um, and also, you know, this that mistakes um, made by a human are preferred to mistakes made by a computer, right? So, so it's not it's not enough for a, a machine learning algorithm AI to be as good as a human. It has to be far better if uh, we have an error tolerance. Uh, this is the issue that you know that self-driving cars have currently. It's it's not enough to be as good as a human driver, and you need to be an order of magnitude better before. Um, humans will trust these at a, at a broad scale. Being right isn't enough, too. So, so delivering the correct treatment or getting to the right diagnosis in healthcare isn't enough. Um, clinicians need to understand the mechanism and be justified in their decision making so that they can anticipate and mitigate against the next problem that a patient might have for which an algorithm might not be available. You know, it, we, we need to truly understand the mechanisms underpinning a specific uh, prognosis, diagnosis, um, testing. Um, and so that's uh, very important, and that's uh, a reason why machine learning has been slow to being adopted in healthcare. And lastly, there's this issue of data sharing. Um, so um, f as, as, as we know, there's uh, protections around machine learning algorithms. A lot of the um, ability of a um, specific um, biomedical company, uh, engineering company, or or software company, uh, their their financial success might depend on protecting their data, protecting their algorithm. Um, but beyond that, in healthcare, there's this issue of protected health information, right? So data sharing, we, we can't even do it if we wanted to in many cases, uh, just because of this this um, uh, the issue of patient privacy. And so so with that overview, we'll, we'll jump into the meat of this topic, uh, this talk now. That being the examples of, of machine learning algorithms and the different dilemmas that each um, each example highlights, and what we the conversations we need to have with clinicians uh, if we're to make progress and implement these models in healthcare. So the first algorithm I want to highlight is a study that was published two years ago in my field's lead journal. Um, it's a algorithm that predicts low blood pressure, hypotension, uh, based on use, uh, a waveform, the arterial uh, blood pressure waveform. And the goal of this study was, was simple. It's to simply use an A-line or an arterial line waveform to predict low blood pressure 10 minutes prior to the event actually happening. It used a data set that had um, three different hospitals, two in the tr uh, training data set, and one in the uh, test holdout set, uh, and uh, these were IC patients in the intensive care unit and the operating rooms. And it was um, developed um, by using many, many, many more features within the A-line waveform beyond simply the blood pressure. So when a clinician uses an A-line, it's really um, only a couple of things that they're looking at. They're looking at the, the systolic blood pressure, the diastolic blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure, and, and the heart rate. Whereas a machine learning algorithm can extract much more information than that. Um, in this study, it actually took the arterial line waveform and broke it down into 3,000 different features. And using combinations of those features, um, they were able to actually come up with another 2 million combinatorial features to create a, a total feature set of uh, just over 2.5 million waveform features. And the performance of this algorithm was very, very good. So it had a um, area uh, C statistic of, of around 0 0.96, 0 0.97, and what and and this this graph just basically shows you how it performs in, in real time in, in certain cases. And this is just one example case where on the top figure you have the patient's blood pressure on the y-axis and on the x-axis you have time in minutes. And then in the and you can see the patient's blood pressure slowly decreases over time, gets to a mean arterial pressure less than 65, which was the threshold for hypotension, 
uh, on the far right side of this graph. And um, on the lower figure, you can see the hypotension prediction index, and this was the probability that a patient's blood pressure would um, get below 65. And you can see that um, about 15 to 20 minutes before the patient actually had a hypotensive event, this hypotension prediction index was pretty close to 100% certain that this was going to happen. And so pretty, pretty interesting and, and a very accurate algorithm. Um, but, you know, the question that clinicians are asking, uh, the million-dollar question is, can it actually improve or, or prevent hypotension? And the billion-dollar question is, can it actually improve outcomes? And it turns out that the answer is not obvious. Uh, earlier this spring, JAMA published a paper where this machine learning algorithm that's now FDA approved, and it's a medical device that can be um, used in the ORs, um, they showed that it successfully reduced hypotension um, in a small single center study. And just a couple weeks ago, a similar study arrived at the opposite conclusion that the use of this in real time by clinicians um, who, you know, were not, you know, this, not data scientists, but uh, um, educated on how this, this uh, tool worked, uh, they did not uh, significantly reduce rates of hypotension when caring for patients uh, undergoing uh, surgeries. And so this just highlights um, that there is a need for re uh, reproducibility. Uh, there's a reproducibility crisis in, uh, often in, in healthcare, uh, and, and this is even more accentuated in with machine learning algorithms. Uh, that, that research needs to be done in large, diverse populations to understand the generalizability and the effect of algorithms on outcomes. And so this, this raises an important issue, um, you know, beyond just the success of an algorithm, um, beyond doing a, a randomized controlled trial to test how well a machine learning algorithm achieves its goal, um, we need to understand you know, will it not lead to major unintended harms? And so some of you may know that the FDA has taken some discrete steps to evaluate uh, machine learning algorithms by coming up with specific regulations uh, for software as a medical device. And those regulations, you know, are, are essentially threefold. It, it needs to demonstrate a association between the algorithm and the clinical condition being diagnosed or predicted. Uh, we need to validate that. We need to understand how the predictions are accurate, reliable, and precise. And then we need to see, does do the algorithms work in the real world? And to regulate exactly how fast these devices enter the real world, uh, the FDA has recognized that the potential for harm hinges on how significant the intervention is and how serious the situation is. So this table just shows just a regulatory framework uh, for how tightly a specific algorithm needs to be uh, s um, regulated before uh, real-world implementation. And on the, the columns in this table are arranged um, from, I guess, from right to left, you have increasing significance. So if, um, you know, if your algorithm is simply informing clinical management, um, that's a less... Um, Less, uh, you know, that, that, you know, just used as a as a clinical decision support. That's that's okay, but um, if it's actually diagnosing a specific disease or establishing a specific treatment, um, that's a much stronger intervention that needs to be much more tightly regulated. The rows in this graph um, are arranged by increasing criticality. So, if if you have an algorithm, you know, on the bottom here, a non-serious. Um, can, uh, situation. Let's just say we are using a algorithm to predict um, how how long a patient's going to spend in our outpatient clinic, and we're trying to optimize our outpatient clinic schedule. Um, that's uh, that's one thing. But if we're actually um, using an algorithm that predicts um, a patient uh, having a major complication after surgery, for example. Um, that's a much more critical situation and much more, uh, there needs to be a much uh, greater regulation around that, that type of situation. And so just rearranging those cells in that table, um, the FDA has come up with a kind of staged approach for how tightly regulated each specific 
um, a, a specific machine learning algorithm uh, is before going to market. Um, and, and clinicians are, you know, we're, we're very risk averse, especially anesthesiologists. Um, you know, our job is to make safe and otherwise very complex or high risk procedure. And so, you know, you know I'm, we're taking care of very sick patients. Uh, they're undergoing, you know, potentially one of the biggest physiologic stressors in their life. Um, and so we need to trust that the equipment that is supporting the patient through their surgery is, you know, we need to be able to trust that that's gonna, going to be reliable and, and, and work. And so, you know, spelling out how a, your software as a medical device has been reviewed and certified is not just a minimum requirement imposed by the FDA. It's really an essential component that is needed to build clinician faith that the tool is safe. And, and I don't want to go into the details of this slide. I just want to make everyone aware that this is a very important thing that clinicians are taking seriously, um, this, this FDA approval process. Um, and it goes in kind of a cycle here, uh, starting with um, the preclinical certification uh, and then an, a streamlined review and then an iterative assessment in, in the real world, the performance that feeds back again to um, the FDA review. Um, and promoting this reality to clinicians is, is useful. Most are unaware of the fact that there are, this, is, is this FDA approval process in place and that, um, that uh, there's plenty of uh, software, medical devices that are entering the real world. Um, these are just a few of the highlight uh, some of the ones more recently as they're uh, very important to my own colleagues, anesthesiologists, uh, looking at, um, for example, predicting, predicting uh, atrial fibrillation or detecting that in, in patients uh, wearing Apple Watches um, or looking at uh, taking EKG waveform and predicting if a patient may have heart failure or using a chest x-ray uh, image and using image processing to uh, arrive at diagnoses within chest x-rays. Those are all FDA approved algorithms that, that are important to anesthesiologists and are important to uh, other clinicians as well. And promoting this, um, you know, this awareness of the FDA approval process I think it's, it's important for clinicians to earn trust in these outcomes. So I'll move on to an, another example. Um, this is an example um, worked on by a, um, a number of clinicians at the University of Michigan. You may recognize some of the co-authors on this preprint um, uh, manuscript, but uh, they're all U of M uh, clinicians, many with uh, expertise in machine learning. Um, and the this study, was was looking at a um, a what was called a deterioration index model for uh, um, pr predicting um, patients with COVID-19 who were admitted uh, to the hospital in a non-ICU setting, predicting their uh, potential to deteriorate. Um, and so the goal of the study was t to uh, detect in early stages a uh, patient who is deteriorating, and deterioration defined as being transferred to an ICU being uh, mechanically ventilated, so intubated and mechanically ventilated, or, or, or death. So in any three of those outcomes, uh, we wanted to detect uh, as early as possible. Uh, the study used a cohort of, of Michigan COVID-19 patients admitted to a non-ICU setting and collected fairly standard data that is available on most any patient in the hospital, um, demographic data, uh, vital signs collected by nurses, assessments collected by nurses, um, so their oxygen requirement, their Glasgow coma squ uh, score, their EKG rhythm, and then lab values that are commonly drawn on, on most inpatients in the hospital. And the model outputs a score from 0 to 100, representing their likelihood of deterioration. And it had a, a modest performance, um, by no means perfect, by no means w useless, but a uh, modest performance. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're left with this um, understanding that the, the model perf performs modestly well, but, um, you know, the c questions that clinicians will, will be having um, before getting any further is they want to know how this works, you know, why should we trust it, why should we not trust it, in, in what situations is this model potentially more trustworthy and, uh, than, uh, than in other situations. And what do we actually do with this information? So what if we know that a patient is likely to deteriorate? What are we actually going to do differently um, had we not had that information? And so 
um, you know, th there's a stress that, you know, at a minimum, the model has to be accurate, but that's only a starting point. Um, and really to gain clinician faith in machine learning algorithms to actually improve patient care, there's a number of different layers uh, to consider beyond just the accuracy. Um, and so building up from a base layer of accuracy, the next stage is really that a model needs to be transparent. So a clinician needs to understand what factors are driving a prediction model. We all know about this as, as experts um, in, in developing these models, so that, uh, that transparency is a good thing. Um, it's, it's really important, you know, in, 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 Transparency is, is important in healthcare because mechanisms are important. So um, just like the causes of um, a complication, um, you know, the, the causes um, of um, low blood pressure or low oxygen levels might imply different treatments. You know, the same is true for a prediction model. If we know what's driving a prediction model, that helps us know how to act on it. Um, beyond transparency, th there's this layer of, of credibility. So does uh, the variables or the features that are driving a prediction model fall in line with expert opinion or are they in stark contrast to potentially decades of literature on a particular topic? And so we know that experts can be wrong, but it's, it's much more rare. Uh, uh, it's, much, it's, it's much less commonly true than the converse. And so for a model to be credible, um, it needs to be influenced by features that have plausible uh, biologic mechanisms underpinning their association uh, with the outcome. So, for example, if a deterioration model um, largely hinged on a patient's age and their vital signs, um, that would be more credible to a critical care physician than a model which seemed to be driven by the day of the week or maybe the patient's height or some obscure lab value. And it's not to say that those, that useful inferences can't be made by um, by the time of day or, or, the, or an obscure lab value or the patient's height. It just means that it, it carries less weight than factors um, that an intensivist, that, a, that a, cl a critical care physician has come to trust through decades of established research and, and teaching. And so if a model fall, if the features driving a model fall in line with expert opinion, um, those models tend to be more trustworthy than features, than models that are derived upon features that really don't fall in line with a expert's way of thinking. And then finally, at the pinnacle of all this is whether a prediction model is actionable or it's at least informed by modifiable risk factors, right? So it's one thing if we build a risk model based on age, race, and gender. It's another thing when we build a prediction model um, based on features that can be modified in real time, such as the patient's blood pressure, their oxygen levels, their hematocrit. Because um, these variables can plausibly be tied to interventions and there's at least the potential to inform decisions, uh, treatment decisions beyond just risk stratifying um, a patient. And so taking into account these principles of transparency, of credibility, of actionability, let's take a look at the Epic Deterioration Index. This is a uh, way that, uh, that Epic displays machine learning predictions to clinicians who may not necessarily be data scientists. So on the, on the left side of this, you can see this 41.9. So th there's a 41.9% there's a chance that uh, this patient in front of us will have, um, you know, will eventually require a mechanical ventilation or transfer t uh, to the ICU or, or death. And, um, you know, we need to understand what, what is driving this 41.9%. And so not only do clinicians get this probability, um, they get, uh, transparency into the characteristics that are driving this model. We can see all of these listed here, um, you know, at least the most uh, important factors contributing to this score. The, the machine learning model also gains some credibility by showing, um, you know, how important the features are to the model. And we can see that the features that bubble to the top are things that make sense to a clinician, you know, an elderly patient. We know that um, patients with COVID, it's, it's, you're a much higher risk, um, you know, that they, um, if you're elderly compared to a younger patient that falls in line with expert opinion. And so seeing that as the major driving factor to this risk score uh, helps improve the credibility of this model to a clinician. Um, and then lastly, this model embraces some actionability by incorporating at least a few potentially modifiable risk factors. Right, so the, the oxygen level, the blood pressure, 
um, the pH of the blood. These are things that clinicians can actually modify through different uh, pharmacologic, physiologic treatments. And so we in include these in the model. Um, there's at least, um, although, although you know, all we have is, is association, we don't have causation, we at least have modifiable risk factors that a physician can consider uh, when um, examining a patient and, and trying to understand if this patient is a high-risk patient or a low-risk patient for deteriorating. Okay. Uh, the next example I want to focus on is part of my own work. It's um, a machine learning algorithm that uses um, data collected in the OR, perioperative data, um, to uh, improve the early detection of heart failure. Um, and um, and I want to go through this very briefly and, and highlight some issues with clinical actionability that we're grappling with currently. Um, so the goal of this project it was to use the intraoperative anesthesia record as a stress test. So there's this concept of a cardiac stress test. Uh, we want you know cardiologists want to make sure that a patient can um, withstand the stress of a surgery without having any cardiovascular complications. Um, we can we can use you know uh, data from a surgery itself to to look at um, the cardiovascular health of a patient. You know, granted, we want to we hope to have understood the patient's risk before they go to surgery. But once they're in the surgery, we do have this free data that we can use to further inform our assessment of a patient's overall cardiovascular health. And so the algorithm works something like this: we had a patient who was t undergoing surgery. They had a preoperative evaluation and then they underwent the surgery. We used data collected during the preop evaluation, so medical comorbidities, demographic data, um, uh, vital signs in the preoperative evaluation. And we combine that with data collected during the surgery, physiologic data, medication data, uh, ventilator data. And in each of these stages, we computed the probability that a patient might have heart failure and other cardiovascular conditions. And we used this as a potential, um, you know, the, the high probability patients, we, we potentially referred uh, to a, to, 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 to first an anesthesiologist to adjudicate uh, whether or not this patient was a patient. Uh, the, you know, the algorithm, you know, had a high, you know, deemed that this patient had a high risk of heart failure, but does, does an anesthesiologist agree? And um, if, if so, uh, to potentially refer these patients to cardiologists for follow-up and um, a formal diagnosis of heart failure um, if it did exist. Um, so in, in this study, we took a cohort of Michigan Medicine patients getting um, surgery that didn't have a preoperative, that did not have a diagnosis of heart failure. And we looked at, um, we, and we divide them into cases and controls. And cases were patients that developed heart failure, uh, had, had a diagnosis of heart failure by two years after the surgery. Within two years after the surgery, somebody ultimately diagnosed them as having heart failure. And we had the remaining patients uh, healthy control. So they didn't have heart failure before the surgery. They also didn't have heart failure within two years after the surgery. We carefully excluded specific patients that um, would cause uh, data leakage in this machine learning approach. Uh, so we excluded any patient that was unlikely to have undiagnosed heart failure. So we excluded cardiac surgeries or surgeries that you have because you have heart failure. Um, and, um, and you know, th th those, those patients would not be useful for a prediction algorithm. Uh, the clinician should already be aware um, as to whether or not that patient has heart failure. And we also excluded patients that developed heart failure as a consequence of the surgery or as a consequence of their acute surgical condition. So if a patient um, was in a motor vehicle accident coming in uh, for a, a trauma surgery and later developed septic shock and developed heart failure as a result of their sepsis, um, those patients were also excluded from this algorithm. You know, the goal of this algorithm was to detect patients that had insidious, um, you know, um, early stage or impending heart failure that may have been missed during the preoperative period. We wanted to use this, the, the intraoperative data to help inform a, a kind of a post-test probability of, of the patients having heart failure. And so to do this, uh, we, we, we recognize in the, when a patient has surgery, there's a couple of different cardiovascular stressors that happen. Um, a patient comes into the OR, and before they, um, bef before they have the surgery, they undergo induction of anesthesia. So we give 
um, these patients uh, medications that drift them off to sleep that actually have um, pretty significant cardiovascular depressant effects. And patients with heart failure will react differently uh, to these drugs than patients uh, with that are that are healthy. Um, and then and then these patients are intubated, and and that um, transition from breathing spontaneously to being put on a breathing machine temporarily for the surgery, that's a, that's a cardiovascular stressor. And, and you can see um, different responses based on um, the cardiovascular health of a patient. A patient in heart failure may react differently to the stress of mechanical ventilation than a patient that is healthy. We did the same thing around incision. So when the surgeon makes an incision, the patient's asleep and they're um, un unconscious of the decision, but their sympathetic nervous system is still intact and can mount a cardiovascular stress response to a pain stimulus. And so although a patient's not conscious to experience the pain, their sympathetic nervous system is still intact and reacts to the pain. And so patients with cardiovascular disease, again, may mount a different stress response to a surgical incision than a healthy patient. So we, we looked at that time period around surgical incision. And then we did the same thing at the, at the, at the end of the case, just, at the, just like at the beginning of the case when we transitioned the patient from breathing spontaneously to on a breathing machine. We wanted to look how that patient did coming off the breathing machine, waking up from anesthesia, extubated, and back to breathing spontaneously. So we looked at that time period. And with each, within each of these time periods, we summarized different... Um, we, we, took, we collected data from different sources. So we looked at physiologic data, the blood pressure, the heart rate, oxygen levels. Uh, we looked at ventilator data. We looked at medications and fluids that we were giving uh, these patients that were charted with high accuracy in the anesthesia record. And with each of these data sources, we, and we developed different summary statistics, different, um, I guess, feature engineering is how I describe this. Uh, but within each segment, we looked at different summary stats and as well as other more, c more complex stats like for heart rate, for instance, we looked at heart rate variability. Um, and we took each of these and, and we developed a feature set of over a thousand intraoperative features. We combined that with all of our preoperative data and then we used these, uh, this combined feature set to train a machine learning algorithm to predict uh, the probability that a patient had uh, undiagnosed heart failure. And um, f for more information about the performance of this algorithm, I'd refer you to the study. But the punchline is that although the algorithm had a reasonably good performance, it was limited by a low positive predictive value, meaning that the algorithm had an unacceptably high false positive rate to be clinically useful. And that's really forever a limitation um, to a prediction algorithm focused on rare diagnoses or events. Um, and that's very common in anesthesia. Unfortunately for, for me, uh, you know, anesthesiologists are very much focused on preventing the very rare but catastrophic complication. And so uh, prediction algorithms have to be very close to being perfect if we want them to be clinically actionable. And so this issue of positive predictive value is, is very, uh, very much a challenge um, in anesthesiology. It was a challenge in this study. And so the solution to handling this is um, although our algorithm is, has a high sensitivity and a modest performance, um, you know, it would be much more useful and much uh, less generative of alert fatigue to clinicians um, if there was a more specific confirmatory test. So we can take these um, patients who screened positive by the algorithm and we can reduce the false positive rate by getting a more specific confirmatory test. There's a specific lab that you can... Uh, order on a patient that has a high likelihood of having heart failure or a s clinical suspicion of heart failure. And you can also get imaging. You can get a, a ultrasound of the patient's heart. Um, you know, that's not, um, it's, it's, it's not a, it's, it's not a super expensive test, but it's not, it's not cheap either. We don't want to do it on all patients, um, but you can get a ultrasound of a patient's heart. And that is certainly much more specific um, and can rule out false positives. And you can get those patients uh, referred to a cardiologist uh, for further evaluation, uh, di a formal diagnosis and management if they do have heart failure. Um, the next example I want to jump to is looking at CPT codes, so clinical procedure codes, um, but basically uh, taking a, um, you know, a surgery that was performed on a patient
and making sure that that it is uh, that the hospital was billing for the. And so the, the goal in, in this algorithm was to um, I- improve anesthesia billing uh, by taking and replacing much of the work uh, done by a human uh, that takes it takes time and it's expensive, um, and seeing if that can be automated. Um, and the issue here is that. Um, this, this billing process is largely dependent on reading in free text uh, within anesthesia records and, and surgery notes uh, for classifying what type of sh- anesthesia, what type of surgery a patient had. Um, and as you can imagine, there's all sorts of typos, um, all sorts of misspellings that happen uh, when we're trying to classify a specific procedure that's uh, um, being done on a patient. And so this this is the, re- the clinical reality of, of many notes is that there's, there's lots of typos. And so just using um, structured data to solve this problem is, is, is not possible. Um, we, we did take some structured data um, in, in you know, the patient, patient's uh, demographics, their, their the length of the surgery, their comorbidities, and that can be used to infer what, what type of surgery the patient had. But really it's, it's a procedure text. It's the surgery op note the anesthesia um, diagnosis and the uh, the surgical diagnosis and the surgical procedure text that um, needs to be analyzed via natural language processing um, that can be used that can be uh, used to dramatically improve the performance of a machine learning based classification algorithm. And so um, the punchline to this study was again that we could with natural language processing techniques we could get the classification accuracy uh, for high confidence cases, so cases where the, n- the most likely procedure was significantly greater than the second most likely procedure. Uh, for those very high confidence cases, uh, we could get a, a very good classification accuracy. And you know, obviously, when we're doing a machine learning algorithm, you know, the turnaround time in these billing codes is, is a second, whereas in uh, if this was done by a human, the average turnaround time is uh, just over a month. Um, and so um, be beyond, you know, demonstrating that it has high performance, there's, and there's this issue of, of trying to figure out, w- you know, in what instances is it useful for a clinician or is it, is it useful for, I guess, a, a billing specialist to be scrutinizing the medical record versus in what instances is it useful for the algorithm to be uh, simply running um, a, pr- you know, a classification, um, we're just solving a classification problem. And so, you know, we need to, re- in, in, we need to revisit this implementation strategy that um, the goal of machine learning algorithms is to improve clinical processes of care. It's not to replace humans. It's just to enable humans to um, achieve a better level of care, a cheaper level, um, you know, more healthcare value. Um, uh, than they would have been able to do without uh, the aid of a computer. And so, you know, th- you know what, uh, what we ended up doing is we ended, and this, this is something that actually is applied right now to uh, surgical cases at the University of Michigan. Uh, we decided to, to, cla- to sort these um, procedures into the high confidence cases versus the low confidence cases. And so the figure on the left basically shows um, we have a, you know, a pre- uh, determined confidence parameter on the x-axis, which is basically um, some measure of the most likely um, procedure um, th- uh, as, as, the, as predicted by an algorithm, uh, the ratio of, of the likelihood that of, of the likelihood of the most likely procedure to the next most likely uh, procedure. And we, we, we recognized that for the ones where the machine learning algorithm was not confident, um, those are the ones that should be scrutinized by a billing specialist, whereas the ones that had high confidence um, on the y-axis, you can see the classification accuracy gets above 95% uh, for these high confidence cases. And, um, and since the accuracy of a billing specialist is 95%, um, we've decided at, at Michigan Medicine that these high confidence cases can just be classified by a machine learning algorithm. And you know, and, and so, you know, it looks like it's a minority, but it's actually a majority of, of cases that are classified by this machine learning algorithm. On the figure on the right, you will see that, um, that you know, the, the, the confidence interval, or the confidence parameter on the, on the x-axis versus the number of cases 
included on the y-axis, and you'll see that um, most cases are high confidence cases. Over 55% of cases um, in this data set, um, the machine learning algorithm has a high confidence in classification accuracy. Um, so that's how, that's how we split up the work. Um, we, we found a role for humans. We know they can, they're much, the billing specialists now can focus on the, the more complex cases that require a, a you know, greater scrutinizing of the medical record, whereas the machine learning algorithm can very quickly automate and, and speed up the, the cases where there isn't very much critical thinking that it's almost certain it's a specific uh, procedure. And so that's greatly uh, reduced our billing costs and, and enabled our billing specialists to focus on um, for, um, for uh, more, more accurately coding the, the, the more challenging. Um, the last example I want to go into, and I think it's the, it's the most controversial, um, is a um, is a study that was published in Anesthesiology two years ago that looked at machine learning um, predictive analytics for um, determining a patient um, getting a low blood pressure after going under anesthesia. So post induction, or at, um, basically after induction of general anesthesia, uh, hypotension or low blood pressure. Uh, we, so the, the goal of this algorithm was to use data available before induction of anesthesia to predict the likelihood that a patient would get a low blood pressure once under general anesthesia. Uh, this was a data set of patients at NYU. Um, we used, they used medical history data, uh, comorbidities, patients' home medications, d demographics, and they used um, some um, early um, surgical data, perioperative data, so they looked at meds given before um, the patient underwent general anesthesia, and they looked at blood pressure and other vital signs before the patient went under general anesthesia, and they used that data to predict the likelihood that a patient uh, would get low blood pressure, unsafe levels of uh, un dangerously low blood pressure after uh, going under general anesthesia. And, um, and again, I I'll refer you to the um, details um, about how this algorithm was developed, um, but the algorithm performance was again modest like some of these other algorithms we discussed today. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, in, in some cases, um, the, you, you know, if we had a high likelihood of post-induction hypotension, you know, the next, the next question a clinician will have is, is well, what do we do about that? What's, what are we actually going to do with that information? And the answer to that is, like so many other things in healthcare, um, it depends. Uh, it depends not only on the nuanced clinical context, but it also depends on the shared values of the anesthesiologist and the patient, and that's what we can call um, judgment for purposes of machine learning model. And, um, so, when we when a machine learning model takes, um, you know, you know what we what we're good at right now with um, um, machine learning is taking data, taking large amounts of data of complex with complex relationships and making a, an accurate prediction. What we're not very good at yet is inferring or determining the judgment or basically the valuation of different outcomes and actions that we need to take to mitigate those outcomes. Um, we're, we're not very good at quantifying or codifying that judgment uh, that informs our action plan based on a, um, you know, the prediction or, or the, the likelihood of a specific outcome happening. And so, what I want to do is I, I want to give everyone a, a hypothetical example of a, a single case where this algorithm might be used. We have an elderly gentleman who has um, carotid disease, so they have a, a risk of having a stroke. They have uh, severe pulmonary disease, so they have a risk of pulmonary complications, and they have uh, chronic kidney disease, so they have a, a chance that they're going to have um, that a kidney injury from this surgery could be um, could cause some severe consequences. And they're getting a, a pretty standard abdominal surgery, a colectomy. And let's just say that we use this prediction algorithm, and the algorithm says we have a post-induction hypotension probability of 98%. Um, well, great. You know, so the next thing is, you know, we're left with is if we trust this, um, if we believe that, number one, we believe that hypotension is bad, and we need to do something about this, if we, and we trust the algorithm, we need to do something about this in order to mitigate the effects of hypotension that might exacerbate um, a complication, that might cause a complication as exacerbated by these patients' pre-existing comorbidities. And there's a couple options that we have. You know, we can do nothing, and if we do nothing, 
this patient will become likely become hypotensive. Um, and they may have a stroke. They might they have a one percent chance of having a stroke. Let's just say for uh, just hypothetically, um, they have a ten percent chance of a of a pulmonary complication. They have a ten percent chance of acute kidney injury or a kidney complication. And we can mitigate that by giving them some fluid, right? So we can raise their blood pressure by giving them some volume resuscitation that in that reduces their chances of hypotension and their risk of a stroke. Uh, but if we give them fluid, maybe we're adding some fluid to their lungs too. And so um, you have pulmonary edema and you might have a, a higher chance of a pulmonary complication. Um, but on the flip side, you, you know, giving fluid helps blood flow to the kidneys. So you might have a lower risk of a, um, a, a kidney complication. The other option we could do instead of giving fluid is we can give a medication called a vasopressor that basically constricts your blood vessels. It raises your blood pressure. It diverts blood flow away from certain organs, but um, channels blood flow to other organs, uh, mainly your brain. So when you give a vasopressor, you will raise your blood pressure. You'll divert blood flow to the brain, and you'll mitigate the risk of a stroke. Um, probably won't do much in the way of uh, the risk of a pulmonary complication, but you are constricting um, the renal blood vessels, diverting blood flow away from the kidneys, and so your risk of a kidney complication goes up. So, y you, know, you know, we have three co choices of what to do, three consequences with clear trade-offs. And if we recognize that all complications are not equal, that is a stroke, you know, becoming mentally incapacitated, it's probably much worse than having a pulmonary complication or an acute kidney injury then we need to make a judgment call. We, we can't just add up the percentages that, uh, of these complications from happening. We need, um, you know, we need to favor a action plan that mitigates the risk of the most severe complications, so the stroke. Um, but it's not enough to know that a stroke is worse. We need to know exactly how much worse it is than the other complications, right? And so that's um, you know, what reinforcement uh, reinforcement learning might call a policy that, and this is, um, I don't need to explain this to this, this audience, um, you know, this is probably better than, than I do, um, how reinforcement learning might work. But we need to um, assign a burden or a reward, I guess, to each complication, and then, the and then, and then this is useful for training the machine learning algorithm to optimize um, the clinical outcome. So if we say, a stroke is 100 times worse than, and, than a kidney injury and maybe 50 times worse than a pulmonary complication. We now have a expected value problem. We can, we can take these um, relative burdens. We can multiply them by the probability that they might happen in these different uh, actions. And then we, lo and behold, find out that giving the vasopressor was the right choice. It, that uh, considering the trade-offs of the different complications, we minimize the overall burden of complications to this patient um, we mitigated that the most by giving a patient a vasopressor. But the issue here is who decides these relative burdens and rewards? This is something that really is largely unanswered um, in clinical medicine and something that um, clinicians uh, have an intuition for. We, and clinicians would do this on a daily basis all the time, um, but haven't bothered to really codify uh, in discrete terms, these, these relative risks, right? And so um, that's, that's really, um, you know, the, the challenge uh, that we're faced, uh, faced with. And forgetting machine learning for a second, you know, we need to understand, you know, who, who should be having these conversations? Who should be involved? Should they be hospital providers or even, even the patient? And so, the, you know, that, that's, that's really the dilemma, you know, that's facing algorithms going forward is, Although we have a, we may have a, a certain level of performance uh, using data to make a prediction, we don't necessarily have these judgments codified um, that can inform an action plan that a clinician might take. And you know, one option to 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 um, determining judgments is instead of trying to predict the outcome, we can predict the action that a clinician might take, and you can reverse engineer the judgment um, that a clinician might have. You, you if you if you predict the judgment using a machine learning algorithm, um, if you, oh, I'm sorry, if you predict the action being taken, you can infer the judgment. And so that, that's an option that we can, we can look into with machine learning algorithms, but the problem is that it propagates our own biases. So if an if, if a, if a action is taken that is made by a uh, biased clinician and a machine learning algorithm is trained biases, and we all know about you know, the issues of training algorithms on human actions that are inherently biased, and, and we've heard this example time and time again of how Amazon had to discard a 
uh, gender biased hiring tool it, that tended to favor uh, males over females simply because um, the hiring process uh, was done by humans and favored uh, and, and had, had an implicit bias favoring males. And so take home points for this talk are that um, machine learning for healthcare, for anesthesia care is conceptually feasible. And the next steps really are to have these conversations with clinicians that machine learning algorithms can be generalizable, they can be safe. We're aware of the biases and we're aware they need to be clinically actionable. And so what we can do today as, um, as machine learning experts that have a, um, a, you know, a understanding of, of healthcare uh, is, is uh, there's things that we need to do to help bridge that gap with clinicians who may not have an expert expertise in machine learning. And what we need to do is we need to promote this literacy of machine learning and AI um, uh, to clinicians, right? So clinicians know they need to be uh, aware of classical statistical techniques of study methodology when they're reading a journal article. They also need to become aware of classic machine of, of you know the basics of machine learning algorithms. And so it's our job to really explain those uh, to clinicians. We need to focus on the right problems to solve, and that's getting at that you know that notion of of you know the the, the low um, criticality non-serious um, event, you know, th that's maybe the starting point for machine learning algorithm before we build up to um, algorithms that predict uh, treatments or diagnoses that have consequences. So you want to start with the algorithm that optimizes your clinic schedule. You may not want to start with the algorithm that predicts whether a patient is going to go to the ICU, you, even though we are doing that, um, but it's just a different level of, of risk and a different level of scrutiny that a machine learning algorithm has to undergo if uh, we want to actually develop that and make it actionable. We need to stick the right inputs, right? So a machine learning algorithm trained on a near infinite amount of irrelevant, biased, or inaccurate data is never going to um, mimic the performance of a clinician who, who has um, access to the right data. Uh, we need to sync, uh, we need to value transparency and actionability. So that's, you know, getting at the notion of, you know, clinicians need to understand why they don't need to just be right they need to understand the mechanisms underpinning a specific disease process or, or treatment process and lastly we need to know our biases we need to make clinicians aware of their biases and um, we, we, we need to understand how they might impact a machine learning model trained on humans with these implicit biases so making these biases conscious um, these unconscious biases conscious is a very important thing for improving the performance of an algorithm, for earning a clinician's trust that a machine learning algorithm will be usable and actionable. And so with that, I'll, I'll leave you with these references. Again, I um, apologize that I was unable to um, give this talk live, but um, I welcome you to con email me, uh, contact me, and I'm very happy to talk about some of the issues um, covered in this presentation. So thanks again. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you guys sometime soon.